But as we heard in the previous session this morning, uh, there's been thought and development since 2008 and even before that. Today, um, Merlin and David and Jim are going to introduce to you to where the Adventist Digital Library stands today. I've introduced um, Jim and Merlin previously. I think many of you already know David Trim. He's already spoken here already this morning. Uh, he's attended several of these conferences uh, in the past few years and is actually the, I guess, the official host for this one. Thank you. Uh, he serves as the uh, director of the Office of Archives, Statistics, and Research here at the General Conference. A post he's held, I believe, since 2010, the session in 2010. He's a historian, an archivist, an educator, whose specialties include European military history and religious history. He was born in Bombay, India, and was raised largely in Australia. He attended Newbold College, King's College, London, and the University of London. Prior to coming to the General Conference, David taught for 10 years at Newbold College. Additionally, he was a senior research fellow in the history department at the University of Reading and is currently a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. David has published nine books and over 40 scholarly articles and book chapters. Also, uh, already today, you've heard um, the, the name Julie Johnson or Juliet Johnson mentioned. Uh, she's the digitization supervisor at the Center for Adventist Research at Andrews. I'll just read a little bio here about her. Um, she's a missionary's child, having grown up in the Far Eastern Division, a number of exotic places which I would like to visit, but she's actually lived there. It's amazing. Prior to coming to Andrews, she worked in the admissions office at the Longland University School of Medicine. She's been at Andrews since 2011, and she's been in her current position since 2012. She enjoys computers and doing family history. So, uh, let's get started. I, I believe David was going to say a few words, and then Merlin will follow. I'm not sure how you're going to divide the time, but uh, we'll see. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I wouldn't speak for long, just to give you uh, my perspective uh, on this. Uh, and firstly, because I'm an historian, uh, I have to correct uh, part of Merlin's chronology, uh, because there's nothing worse than inaccurate dates. Um, actually, the first time Merlin and I discussed this was in March 2011, and while Jim is correct, I was appointed at the Annual Council uh, of 2010, but it takes time for uh, one to get a U.S. visa and also to process the uh, general conference paperwork, which actually took longer than an American visa, uh, such as the, the, the systems we have. Um, and so I only first arrived here in February of 2011. Uh, Merlin invited me to come to Andrews to speak to his uh, Ph.D. class on archives. I think uh, he has, a, I think, every other year a course on archives. Uh, and while there, I, uh, I met Jim as well, was, uh, and spoke with him about uh, this, this idea for Adventist resources online. Uh, now, at that stage, of course, I was aware that m the department I was taking over had an extremely large web presence, uh, thanks to my predecessor, Bert Holoviak, under whose uh, directorship, one and a half million pages of content were digitized. Uh, and also owes a lot to someone who's not here and won't be here, but uh, Jonathan Brower, uh, who used to work in the Office of Archives, Statistics and Research and now works in the main uh, GT GC IT department, Information Systems and Services. Jonathan was really the, the person responsible for creating the whole suite of websites that ASTR maintains. Uh, and since he moved to IASS, as we call it, Information Systems and Services, Joshua Marco has taken over and done a good job as well. Um, but uh, the idea of having one platform for all digitized historic Adventist content was what Merlin and Jim shared with me uh, on a, a rather cold March day in uh, at Andrews 2011. 
uh, and it just was an exciting prospect. Uh, and the question, you know, the, the only question I had was, why haven't we done it already? Uh, what can we do to, to, to make it to go further? Uh, and one of the answers was money. Uh, so coming back, I had to do my first budget proposal as director of the Office of Archives and Statistics, as it then was. And I noted in the instructions it said that one could apply for something called a departmental special. Uh, so I, I talked with Jim and with uh, Lisa Beardsley Hardy, the director of the education department, uh, and said, you know, perhaps we could all put in for, uh, for, for a sum and then we'd get a much larger sum collectively than we would if just one of us asked. And so we were able to get $75,000 as an appropriation from the GC Treasury. Uh, and so things really then flowed from there. Uh, at that June 2011 ASDAL at PUC, some of you uh, may remember, it was the first one I attended, I gave a, a, a paper, and at that time also was the, was the conversation that Merlin recalls where we talked about other prospects. At that stage we looked at, and we worked actually with uh, what are they called, Jim? There's a, a, a chap who does, has a website at Berrien Springs. Sim yes. Ex Simple, updates. Simple updates, exactly. And we created a, a website that could do a, a, a one search of the E.G. White writings, ASTR, and uh, the idea was to access the digitized content of the Center for Adventist Research. And they set that up, and sure enough, you could put in one search term into one window, and then you'd get three windows open with all the responses. But we quickly discovered that this didn't work um, because one was not comparing or searching the same sorts of things. Uh, in particular, one actually searched the James White Library catalog, and so one got every hit regardless of whether it was digitized or not. So if you were to put in James White, for example, you got a huge number of hits, uh, most of which didn't actually take you to digitize content. And if you search for the E.G. White writings, you, would, you could get both content but also bibliographical information, metadata, whereas if you search my departments, you would only get the content. So you would get these three search windows, but it wasn't actually terribly helpful. But that was a start. And then we started to realize the dimensions of the problem. We started to spend the money that the GC Treasury had, uh, had given us and discovered that we needed more. And at that stage, Jim and Merlin and I spoke with the, the GC Treasurer. This is in now the spring of 2012. Uh, and they agreed to give us another $75,000, this time as, uh, from the what's called the supplemental budget. Um, and in addition to that, I may say we've had some other grants uh, for extra technology, in particular hardware. Um, so the, the, the project has been supported uh, quite generously by the GC Treasury, and the words supported quite generously and GC Treasury don't always go in the same sentence. Um, but this, I, I think, uh, comes, it comes back to what I said earlier. The current GC officers recognize the importance of information and resources, and recognize the importance of making them available, recognize too the fact that church members don't always have a reliable place to look, and therefore the desire to create a place on the internet where you can get authoritative, uh, reliable resources on Adventist history and identity. Uh, so there's a, a, the current GC Treasurer is particularly keen on that, and so we've received that sort of, of support. Um, at the 2011 ASDAL meeting, it was agreed uh, to appoint a representative to work with Merlin and Jim and I, and that was Joel. Uh, Jim continues to work in his other hat as Centre for Adventist Research, but obviously represented Adventist Resources as well. And over the autumn of 2011 and 2012, we had some good and productive meetings. There's no need to go into all the, the history of the, uh, the options we explored and some of the technologically blind alleys we went up before returning and trying something new. 
Um, but you know, gradually we have we have worked out, I think, a uh, a good model to follow. Uh, that has been due to many people, and I would just and I, this isn't meant as a rebuke to Merlin because it was Merlin who himself pointed out to me in the break that he hadn't been able to acknowledge everyone. Uh, the meeting after the meeting last May that was held here with the library directors. Uh, two committees were set up, uh, one under Steve Souder to work on um, the technological sort of benchmarks that would be needed, uh, and another on governance. Uh, and I just want to thank Steve publicly, there he is, for the work that he and his group did. Uh, as things have developed, perhaps in some ways we haven't utilized uh, their work as fully as might be. However, Without their work, we would not have been able to solve the problem uh, of how to import uh, metadata, Mark 21 type sort of records, with the digital records. And that was something which emerges absolutely essential from the meeting with library directors. And I can see from various heads nodding here that a number of you would, would agree with that. So Steve's work on that was absolutely important and essential. Uh, and also Paulette worked on uh, a model for, for governance. So I just want to acknowledge both those groups that uh, did that more specialized and focused work. Um, that sort of hopefully brings us all up to date from where Jim stopped, which was circa 2009, maybe 2010. Uh, and just sort of to give you a, a broader picture, uh, that, and I do want to emphasize that this is something now that is not just a matter for librarians. The wider church is interested in this is very keen to see uh, the product come out, uh, is very keen to see not having multiple places to look for Adventist historic material, as is the case now, but one place, especially so that we can point church members towards that. That leads to a more pastoral concern, and I think that's a good point at which to uh, hand back over to Merlin. I want to say just one more word about the white estate and its its part. I didn't want to say earlier that it didn't work what the white estate was working on because it's been in development. And I was chatting with Daryl just briefly on the break. How was it that you said it? But uh, like use your mic and say it there. It was like trying to look at a dress that was all cut out and not yet sewn together. Yeah, and what we're seeing now is the dress more put together. There's still more work to do, a lot more work, and we'll hear about some of that too. But the dress is coming together, and I don't know where it would be without the excellent and valuable programming and development work that's been done by the White Estate, and particularly in our interaction with Stefan. I know he's not here, he's on vacation, but uh, he's worked very closely the last months on this as well. And of course, Daryl giving leadership to the many projects for the White Estate electronically has been very, very important. And uh, I think that we would not, at the Center for Adventist Research, have built some of the expertise and knowledge that we're starting to gain were it not for doing things at the for the needs of the White Estate to help us build as well. And of course, the resources that the General Conference provided has also helped with equipment as well as programming, and that's been important as well. Um, we have a little video, the brief six minute video that's been put together just to uh, introduce, and let's just go ahead and, and play that right now. I think you can see it on the two sides. This year, 2014, is 170 years 
since our Advent movement began in 1844. That's a very long time and some would say it's a miracle that a little group of believers, a few hundred, have grown into 18 or more million around the world. Others would say it's a very long time to wait and there's a whole generation of young Adventists who don't even remember the 20th century. How are we going to keep that whole family focused together on a shared mission? The answer, the Adventist Digital Library. Let me explain it to you. During that long history, especially the early years, many things were written and said and thought out and studied, and they're hidden away in libraries and archives around the world. We would like to digitize this material and put it into the Adventist Digital Library for everyone to read everywhere in the world. Access should be given to all Adventist schools, all young Adventist students, workers, teachers, Sabbath school teachers, anyone who has a passion for the Adventist mission and would like to know how it all began. That is the Adventist Digital Library and I very much hope you will support it. It is not a job for one person or one institution. We live in the information age. If you want to find something out, you can do so quickly and efficiently from anywhere in the world. This means that information is competitive. And if we want to offer our information, we need to make sure that it's readily available and easy to find. Currently, within the North American Division alone, there are hundreds of church websites, official websites, and that means that there's going to be a host of different places you go to find your information. The problem with this is that it can be difficult, if not impossible, to find what you're looking for because you don't know where it's located. And for the average person accessing, say, a video or an article, finding the right place to go to is difficult. This means that our various church institutions need to work in concert together and partner together to deliver our information efficiently and effectively. Large databases like the Adventist Digital Library can make sure that this happens. Well, what I'm most excited about is right now in my research I have a dozen or more Adventist sites that I refer to for this, that, or the other. And it's, it is kind of difficult to keep those things straight and sometimes you have to spend more time trying to remember which site it was that you were going to for which particular document to piece together some history that you're working on. But the Adventist Digital Library has the opportunity, um, and I've seen the, the test site, and it looks great, and it has the opportunity to bring all of these things together to where you, you not only have them in one source, in one area, but, but it has great searching capabilities, and it's a powerful, powerful search engine in and of itself. A lot of these other sites, they don't necessarily have the ability to search as much as what the Adventist Digital Library will be able to do. When I think of the Adventist Digital Library, as a student studying theology, uh, anticipating going into the field, going into ministry to touch people's lives with the Word of God, when those questions come up as to who are we as Adventists and where are we, you know, where are we from, where are our roots, I think it's awesome when I'm able as a minister to go to a one-stop shop, one place where I can access all information about Adventist history and to point them as well, either members or visitors, to a place where they can see Adventist history, they can see the pictures, they can hear the audio of, of, of that history, um, they can see articles, and they can relate easier to who they are, where they are now, and where we come from in the church. And so I'm excited, both as a student, uh, both as an individual who's been able to work with the project, and as um, a minister anticipating working in the field, um, the Adventist Minister Library, and really excited about this project. Let us talk for a moment about the libraries where resources are kept in all our Adventist institutions and that means we have to talk a little bit about our librarians. They have for a long time collected material and helped us access that through indices and archives and summaries, handbooks, manuals, reference materials, all the tools students need. This is another tool. And I'm asking our librarians to think about how they can be part of this new digital world of information we want to make available to our students in our institutions around the world. So help us enlarge the access 
to Adventist thinking maintained in our libraries and institutes and archives and service areas around the world. You are our best allies, librarians. Help us out. Thank you for your support and your interest in this project. What do you think of that? That's interesting, isn't it? Andrews University president has taken a real interest and I appreciate that. Can we just stop the discussion about the details a little bit and step back and think of value for a few minutes, spiritual value. And I would like to just spend a few minutes reflecting with you on that. And to do that, I feel I need to have a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we realize as humans we we many times fumble and stumble around trying to see which direction you're leading and how you're working and what you're doing in this world. But you have so often come through and made sure that your purposes are accomplished and your will is done. I pray you would help us for a few minutes here as we think of the spiritual implications of what we're talking about that we could uh, be blessed by your spirit, and it's that we seek in Jesus' name. Amen. I last weekend was at Madison College, uh, where we have cooperated with them, at least at the Center for Adventist Research, to digitize, to work on digitizing their materials, which their alumni association have donated to us quite a lot of materials, and it looks like there'll be more from that self-supporting section of the of the church historically and Julie's worked on a lot of that and as I showed them on our website the little module that we had put together for their materials they became so excited that Madison College even though it had closed 50 years ago because <laughs> it was 1964 was still able to make some contribution based upon its materials that could be seen and looked at uh, afterwards, spontaneously, a couple of people began to speak. I think of this one man, he was obviously overly exuberant, but he said, could we start Madison College again on the internet? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, that was a huge leap that he had made, but the, the thought was, though, it's meaningful, that he, he and the others could begin to see that their materials could continue to make a contribution and help people to understand how God had worked in the past. And that, that was quite exciting. Um, a text that I have thought about is I've thought about the Adventist Digital Library is Isaiah 52, 7. It goes a different direction, perhaps uh, in its literal sense from digitization, but I think it does have a connection. Um, Isaiah 52, 7 is really talking about Jesus and the Messiah that would come and about the gospel. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good news, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. So you have this beautiful picture of someone traveling on the mountains by foot to bring the gospel, to bring good news to people. And really, we as Seventh-day Adventists resonate with that because in a, in a way that's what we're trying to do as we think of the Three Angels message and the, the idea of the Gospel going to the world looking for the coming of Jesus. And of course, the Three Angels message begins with the words, the first angel, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting Gospel. So here's this good news again. To preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven, earth, the seas, and the fountains of waters. And it goes on, but it, it begins with this proclamation of the gospel to the whole world, and that's what the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been about. Now, I appreciated that uh, Jim Nix, for the devotional, talked a little bit about publishing, because that has been our first ministry as a church. You go back to 1848, 
There they were, just in the midst of the first year or first summer of Sabbath conferences as they were kind of the movement is forming and they're realizing that they are going to have a mission to the world. And that conference there in Dorchester where she had that vision was a decision about how the Sabbath was to be proclaimed to the world and how it was connected to the ceiling and how it would go. And then she has this vision that it would be like streams of light going around the world. And then she tells James White, you have to publish a paper. And of course, that then leads to The Present Truth and the Review and Herald and the whole publishing work of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Last year, I was down in Peru talking to the folk there, some at our university near Lima, and there was a group of call porters that were being dedicated. The work is very strong in Peru, the call porter work, and they asked me on the spur of the moment, we want you to have the dedication for the new call porters. There were several hundred of them there. And share some words, Sabbath morning. I heard about that late Friday night. So I was in prayer, Lord, what, what do I share? How am I going to speak to these call porters? And so I put together a little bit of a talk, and we had a prayer. I think it went well, but what was in my mind, and I didn't say to them, because these call porters were selling books, and that's good. Not, that's how we've done it. But what kept echoing in my mind is, I'm dedicating call porters to sell books. While right now we're working on putting these books and thousands of others on the Internet so they can be permanently searched and used around the world by everyone in real time. And my mind was just overwhelmed with the paradigm shift that we are facing today and what the implications are and what they will be. Um, I read a book of a couple of years ago uh, published in 1974, it's kind of an old one, by Steinberg, 500 Years of Printing, published in England. And I re it was most interesting, because we really are looking at three eras, and I, I'm preaching to the choir here, you folks probably know all of this, but just, just for the sake of our spiritual reflection, go with me for a moment. I, I like the way he presented it, because he, he basically said, and also another uh, book, Michael uh, Clapham, uh, The Printing Revolution in Early Modern Europe, 2005 publication. If a man was born in the fall, at the fall of Constantinople, this was 1453, if you know your history, you know. If he were 50 years old, I'm in my mid-50s, so about my lifespan, if he were 50 years old, he could look back on his lifespan of seeing about 8 million books that had been printed. This is the Incunabula, you know, the period up to, up to 1500. 8 million. And at least the writer of this book, I'm not sure of his accuracy, but he suggests that this is perhaps more than all of the scribes of Europe had produced from the time of Constantine to 1453 a period of well over a millennium because you had written manuscript. Everything was written by hand. So printing exploded the communication of information, and we have been operating on that paradigm up to the present. That's what librarianship works with, has worked with historically. And it's also what we have worked with in the gospel. Now, if you stop and you think about it, when that was happening and you had the Enlightenment and all of the things happening in Europe and, and the exciting new learning that everyone was having and the new ideas, where was God in all of this? Well, it's interesting because God took what was developing at that time and used it as a mechanism for advancing his kingdom and advancing the gospel. We're all aware of Martin Luther. Martin Luther, of course, translated 
the Bible into vernacular, the common German vernacular, right? And now you have printing going on and you have thousands and thousands of copies of the Bible. No longer can the church control access. And so you have then William Tyndale in England translating the New Testament into English. He's, he's, he loses his life for this. Luther didn't wasn't a martyr, but nevertheless, what did God do? He took this technological revolution and he made it a mechanism to create the Great Reformation. Isn't that right? A support for creating the Great Reformation because it put the Bible in people's hands and it put discussion and study on the Bible in people's hands. And the Reformation, of course, has led us to the modern period and coming up right to where we are. If you look at 1844, you look at our movement, in many ways it comes out of all of that study, that consideration, the spiritual focus on scripture and so forth that happened. It goes back to the invention of printing. And we have been under that model. And of course, when you look at the beginning of our church, which I just described, with James White, Ellen White and the others, publishing became a crucial way of taking the gospel then to the, the entire world. Now we all know we have now this next step. We used to talk about spreading the word like leaves of autumn. Think of that metaphor just for a moment. How many of you rake leaves? If you're from California, maybe not as much. I now in Michigan rake leaves. And uh, there's too many to rake. You have to mow them, burn them, and do all kinds of different things. Now you don't burn those in California either, but in Michigan we do. And so, spreading it like the leaves of autumn that just scatter everywhere. But a leaf is one thing that's moving. Isn't that right? You have many of them. That's what the printed page is. It's many pieces of paper, many materials scattering around. And we thought that would be the paradigm that would take the message to everyone. That'll do it. Well, it could. But our new paradigm, as we all know, is not the leaves of autumn. And I can't be eloquent for you right now because I'm not sure quite how to describe it. I suppose there are others who could, and I didn't have time to work on all the other descriptions people have made. But with the Internet now, if you have Internet access, anyone, anywhere, at any time, the same time, can look at the same material. That's the paradigm shift we all, all know about that we work with in the digital world. Isn't that right? What does that mean for the gospel. In the pre-Reformation period and the invention of printing, it wasn't yet clear just what those implications would be. It would take a few more years until what happened in the Reformation would happen to see what would happen, and it did. We are in many ways positioned in the same place, but in our day. And the difference, if we stop and we really think about it is, all the prophecies of Scripture, the existence of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, its worldwide membership, its worldwide educational structures, its health ministries, its evangelism, its ADRA, all of the ministries that are happening, everything is poised and positioned for whatever God might do to use this new technology that we have. It's now a part of our lives where it's changed. You know how it is. I use my GPS still, but I could use my phone. It goes through the internet and so forth. And sometimes I'll do, I'll have my iPad and you're looking to see if a store is open. You go to the internet. Is that right? You're, you're wanting to see what the best price is for something. You're wanting to check on something. Our whole lives interact with the internet now. A few years ago, not at all. Most of us here are, are old enough to remember it's coming. So we are in that same period, as it were, as the pre -print, the early printing. But now in this new paradigm, how will God use this for the gospel? I don't know yet. I don't think we can know. But the more I have thought about it, the more I feel that things like the Adventist Digital Library and other types of things like that are one of the things that God will do to help 
spread the message and the gospel to the world. It's still not true that in every place on every corner of the globe there is internet access. That's not true. Uh, some want to say, well, almost TV is there. It's true. You know, you can go almost anywhere and they'll be running a TV on a battery or something, or at least a radio. But things are moving very rapidly that direction, aren't they? And the world is changing. What will God do? I have come to the settled conviction in my mind that digitizing Adventist materials and making them available is one part of this broader picture that I think is going to open up in some ways God's working in the final movements of this first history and the soon coming of Jesus. I don't want to be dramatic, but it has just seemed to me in the last years as I've been involved in this that God has been working and I think the adversary has also been working trying to trying to stop and disrupt what God might, God's people might do in light of this new development. And the future, of course, will see even stronger attacks from Satan uh, in the Reformation as persecution. Maybe that will probably happen someday soon, too. I don't know. But nevertheless, I think we're dealing with a spiritual issue here, not just a, you know, just an unimpassioned information issue as it relates to Adventist resources and Adventist materials. And I would like to see, and I hope I will see, how God's going to work in the next years ahead of us. It's an exciting time to be living in, would you say? We're looking for Jesus to come, and I am too. And I hope that this Adventist Digital Library can play at least a part in this in, in many different ways. What are some things that the Adventist Digital Library can do. Now this is not complete uh, and this may not be the final statement but let me just share with you kind of a vision statement. The digital library will create one place on the internet where anyone can find comprehensive original sources on Seventh-day Adventist mission, theology, history, culture in order to strengthen Adventist identity and faith <coughs> and provide helpful information. That's just a, a descriptive statement. What are some of the objectives? And I'm presenting maybe more in terms of faith right now as I'm doing this it's from a faith perspective. And there are many we could add that are not from a faith perspective. But one is to strengthen and share Adventist identity, to turn history into story. Uh, for me, that's been the most exciting thing in my life. And I appreciate that about Jim Nix. And I think back, I, I, in 1982, I was at that meeting in the uh, Radcliffe Wing, or where was it, that uh, conference room? It's been too long, I've forgotten the name of the room. Anyway, um, in 1982, and it inspired me. And I remember the photo collage that was put up and other things that were done. And so that was not digital per se, but it was still, we're presenting this now digitally so that everyone can do it. And I have dedicated my life in the recent years, my real core value is trying to reconstruct that history and see what God's message is, what his story is, what he's trying to do to, for us and say to us. The Adventist Digital Library makes it possible to turn history into story. Uh, another objective, it can equip church leaders, pastors, teachers, and members with essential Adventist resources for faith and ministry. I can't tell you how many times we have had pastors needing photographs. i got to have it for this Sabbath for my sermon. And we've worked with them. Has anyone done that sort of thing in your libraries? Some of you have? We still get contacts, but now we point them, many of them, to the Internet and say just make a copy, you've got it, put it in your PowerPoint. And I know the White Estate has the same, done the same thing with their photographs and their other materials. We have now done this without cost so that people can actually just use it, and the White Estate has as well. So it equips church workers. 
A third thing is it supports education, particularly graduate studies throughout the world. Several of our universities are trying to do Adventist or doing Adventist studies programs, but they don't have the large collections of materials that, such as we have at Andrews and such as Loma Linda has, and to a lesser degree some of the other institutions here that do have some good resources, PUC I'm thinking of has some very helpful materials and others, how are they going to provide an effective academic program that connects to Adventist resources? This is an important support uh, mechanism, Adventist Digital Library. Another, maybe apologetic, we might not like to talk about apologetics, but it helps people and it also defends against the church against attacks based on misinformation. You know, there's lots of ideas. When I was a pastor, I had people come to me with things they just knew were true about the Seventh-day Adventist Church and what it taught. And one of the things I was trying to do is say, no, this is how you should really look at it. Isn't that right? Have you ever done that as a Seventh-day Adventist? You know, try to share that. The advantage of the internet is for those who are intentional and dedicated, they can go for themselves and they can look at the sources and come to their own understanding and it also can help those who are trying to share answers find those resources to help people as well. Another valuable objective is that it preserves irreplaceable Adventist historical materials by making them available on the internet. Now, how does it preserve them? We obviously have vaults that preserves the original resources. We need to keep those. We're not going to ever get rid of those. Amen? <sighs> Come on, you folks. <laughs> Don't you have my sense of this? You know, there's. we treasure those originals. We have in our vault William Miller's glasses and one of his pens. We're never going to get rid of that, right? Even if we put a picture of it on the Internet. And we have his Bible, his preaching Bible, one of the ones he used to preach. Are we going to ever get rid of that preaching Bible? No, we're going to keep the originals. But it's preserved in a new way when it's put on the Internet because now everyone sees it, a picture of it, and can use it. And it, it is there so that if something did happen to the original, God forbid, at least under my watch, these are things I'm dealing with, it'd be preserved, but it's also now being used and not going to be handled as much. Isn't that right? People won't wear out those originals because they'll be captured in time and place. So it's very valuable in that way. What are some results in the life of the church? And I'll go through these quickly and then we'll go to Julie's presentation and we'll have some questions and discussion. Certainly the results can be an increase in members' awareness of God's leading in the Second Advent movement to enable pastors to answer difficult questions, increase administrators' knowledge of their local field, enrich personal faith, enhance Adventist higher education in all parts of the world through access to significant materials needed for curriculum success. Six, valuable resource tools for writers and the publishing ministry. And seven, health and wellness information. Could, this list could just go on and on and on. There's Depending on the resources that build, there's just so many ways it can help the results in the life of the church. A place for the world to interface with the church and learn of God's leading. And perhaps nine, it's, this is controversial because right now it's not true, but it can eventually lead to significant savings by the creation of one virtual library rather than creating numerous physical libraries around the world, at least within the aspect of Adventist digital materials, which is not going to be possible because even if you could find the resources, you can't find the original materials. Isn't that right? So it makes it possible to have a library that at least for those many of those who will be served will be less expensive. Of course, the preparation of it and the maintaining of it actually increases the cost for those who are doing that. So these are just some thoughts. I don't know where God is leading us next in our world. I thought Jesus would come before now in my lifetime, just being confessional myself. I said, Lord, you're going to come for sure before I'm thinking about retirement, you know, in a decade. You're certainly going to come before that. Well, he hasn't come yet. 
I've taken a longer view how God is working, but I can't help but stop and think, could it be that this, what we're talking about and we're working on, is one of the key mechanisms that God's going to use to finally bring things together for the coming of Jesus and our return home. Could it be? I think it might be. We'll see how God leads in the future. But we get the, the privilege and the opportunity to be a part of that as Adventist librarians and as those living in this time in our history. All right. We want to go to looking a little bit at the database. I'm going to turn the time over to Julie, and you can just kind of walk us through it. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the, maybe you can also talk about some of the resources that will be put on it, or I'll follow up on that if, if need be. So I'll turn the time over to Julie. Okay, tell me if I'm going too fast. First, I'm going to show you, um, the site that I'm going to show you today is definitely a beta site. It doesn't look anything like um, the vision that we have. It doesn't look anything like what we want it to look like. Um, we're, I'm going to show you functionality. I'm going to show you how things work together. I'm going to show you how bringing different resources from different institutions work. But um, I want to first show you a couple sites that have a more of a, a rounded, view of what um, I would like to, we would like to see. This is the Digital Public Library of America. You guys have probably already seen these sites, but I really like them. Um, everything is very graphical. It's very interactive. It brings things together easily for someone who's not sure what they're looking for. Um, it, you can find things. I, even me just looking at these, you just get drawn in. You keep following the paths and you learn as you go along. The thing I like is that um, the search is big, it's right there. You can just immediately go in if you know what you're looking for and go for it. Um, there's a slideshow going that shows some of the highlights. This side I'd like to show for the exhibition, which I view more as a collection type of thing here in the library world, and hopefully it comes up. This is where we view that we could bring together materials <coughs> into subjects or um, collections, basically. Where we can have different um, sections that highlight, say we decide to do something on um, Millerism, that type of thing. We haven't, there's the Millerism little icon. You click on it and you go in and there's text, there's pictures, there's links, everything right there. Everything that we have associated with Millerism would be in there. And not only just a big page full of links of items, but text that keeps going. You can choose a sub theme within that theme. Say I did, okay, I'm, I'm interested in Millerism, but I want Millerism as it relates to William Miller's personal life how he got involved, that sort of thing. So you go to a sub-theme of him, and you keep going through and discovering based on that. So for instance, I'll go into this. Um, so you go into this topic of the gold rush romanticized, and you see items, the actual physical items that, that um, complement the subject that they're talking about. There's text. Again, there's more text. There's more. Um, someone's taken the time to write about this which is a big, uh, that's going to be a big job as well. You can go to a, the next topic within that topic and the journey west and then there's more items there. So you can kind of get a picture of what we're thinking of where it's really a one-stop shop where you go in and you're able to see everything. Oh, I have my back to that. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're able to go in and see everything in one place. It's put together intelligently and, and interactively and intuitively. And um, you'll be able to see things that way. So there's one. Um, the second. This is the World Digital Library, which I recently discovered. And same type of thing. What I really like about this, they have the same type of a view um, idea where there's play, 
there's time and there's topic. Here you can go in and like when I click up here on place, how they've done it is by major continent. And you can just go through and if a picture hits your fancy, you click on it and go right into the topic, but you can go down and see what area am I interested in. You can um, do the same thing with time, time period, and then the same thing with topic. So that's how they, and both of these sites use library mark records to create mm -hmm. um, these categories. So I'm just, for instance, this is a great way to see how a periodical might, uh, closer. This is a great way to see how a periodical might present on Adventist Digital Library. So let's say I want to go into Africa and let's go to the Uganda Journal. And it has a description of the journal itself, some history on it. You can scroll down and you can see, obviously, this came from a mark record to me. You can um, click on the collection of it and then go and see all the issues that are showing up there. So you have the issues in order if you wanted to browse that way. You can also do a search within it if you want to. And actually click in and see the actual image itself. And you can click this in there. So it's just a little bit of a, these sites give a little bit of an idea of what we're thinking this thing is going to look like in the future. So let's go to ADL. So this is the beta site. When you first go in, there's a, sorry, the projector kind of cutting out a little bit of the top there. But um, we have a, just a little statement at the beginning. Uh, again, this site isn't for public. There's a password, so we don't want people to see it quite yet. I don't know if all of you have already seen this. I know some have. Some. So, um, yeah, again, let me emphasize that how this looks and how it navigates the colors, all of that are going to change. So don't get caught up in all that <laughs> quite yet. <laughs> Um, so let's go just directly into the digital library section. So if you click on this here, we're going to go in. What happens first is all the files actually show up in this main area. You scroll down and you can see you can go to, I don't know how many pages, but a lot of pages. On the um, right side, you'll see a filter section. This is where you can go in and you can filter your search results. Or you can just filter everything at once. If you don't know what you're looking for and you're just curious, you can go in and start clicking some of the filter items and it will it will bring down your search results, narrow it down to help you find what you're looking for. Uh, right now, we, we, we put in a couple things we thought would be interesting. We have a, um, this should say filter by title up there. Um, if you have 100 search results, you can say, no, I know exactly the title of the thing I'm looking for. You would be able to type that in and find it there. You can filter by the media type. This isn't the type of um, necessarily physical media, but it's the type of um, uh, digital media. So a document would be a PDF. So if you click on that, you're filtering out PDFs. Uh, image, you're filtering out JPEGs or TIFF file types. Uh, audio, you're filtering out audio file types, that type of a thing. A file collection, this is something that came up over from, I believe, the, the White Estate site. But again, same type of a concept, that there, the collections could be listed out if there's a part of a major collection. Like at Andrews, we have the, the Review and Herald Library collection. So you could click that and see all the books that were from the Review and Herald Library. Um, series, same type of a thing where, you know, you guys all know what series are. No, <laughs> um, the author or the creator, uh, we have the contributor to ADL. At that place, any institution that has contributed, that's um, indicated. And so you can actually filter out, say, okay, yeah, right, but I just want to see anything that came from the white state. And you click on that and you filter that out. And then there's a date filter as well. And obviously, there's as much fields of data in the database, that's as many filters that can be created. So these are just some examples of the types of filters that um, that can happen. Okay. So up here in this main search box, this is where you can type in your search, your initials, what you're looking for. So
So I'm going to do Madison College. Like Dr. Britt mentioned, we had a big project just recently. So a lot of the data that we put into ADL was for, from Madison College because that's something we were working on already. I always search for quotes because I want to bring up exactly what I'm looking for, <coughs> and um, which is why I put the quotes around it. So you can see we came up with 77 hits in um, the database. There's about 20,000 records in here right now. Um, most of it is the, I believe they did the complete run of the Review and Herald from the GC archive. The White Estate, their records are coming in automatically. Should have probably put this in. And then uh, um, Andrews, we put in about 300 records. And there's a, a handful of things from Loma Linda as well, just to show how it would work. So going down, you can scroll down, and you can see everything that had. You can see that the search term is highlighted in the text to help you kind of browse and see what you're looking for. And then again, so now. You can see that the filters, a lot of the options disappeared because now it took the, I, the search results and said, oh, now no more, uh, I think Loma Linda disappeared from the contributor because none of the things they sent us had anything to do with Madison College. So now you're only going to be, you'll be able to check and click and filter out things that have specifically to do with the materials that are in your search. So let's say, okay, I want to, I'm going to, just because I know our data better. <laughs> um, and let's say I'm going to say, okay, great, but I just want to see the things that are at Andrews. So I, I checked it and I hit the filter, and now there's six items in here that came from um, Andrews University. So I'm going to go actually go in to, yes, I'm going to go into this one called the Madison School. So this would be the page view for each digital item within ADL. So you can see we've done the um, title, the, and I'll, I can say right now, what we've done is we've actually automated, we've created import scripts with the help of Steve Souter and Stefan at the White Estate has helped as well, and we've created a script processes whereby you can take a mark record from the catalog and convert it to XML, which is a metadata format file, um, converted it over to there, and then it gets uploaded into this database automatically. So there's no need to enter everything one by one, that type of thing, which is a good thing. So this um, title field has taken the title and the subtitle from the mark the creator author is from the mark author field. We created the citation, which I believe is important for any um, website to help it with, so people can just copy and paste that into their papers. And we use Caribbean style and Andrews, so you can always do whatever. Um, so as you go down here, now you can see the actual physical item. In this viewer, you can make it smaller or bigger. Here, there's a download button where you can actually download the original right to your computer if you decide you want to have it. Um, some stuff, and again, you're going to see some things that look weird. They're broken, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing I'm going to show you right now, the whoop, yeah, full screen view, not so good. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, in the future, the full screen view will actually go full screen. <laughs> actually, Stefan's talking to the um, ma the manufacturer of the software. Um, they, they, we have, we're in discussions with them because we, we found a lot of bugs in their stuff by the things that we wanted to do. So they're talking back and forth on figuring that out. And then you can see right um, here that my search um, term shows up here on this little um, button. If I click it, it will go in and find that text within the item, show me here so I can navigate through and highlight it over on the right. 
So you don't have to again search, once you're in the item, you don't have to again search to find what page it's on. You can actually do that very quickly here. And then you can use that out. Um, uh, just a word about how we're scanning it, Andrews, and I'll talk more about this in the meeting this afternoon. Uh, we do full page spread scanning because our, the, and the big reason is because we want to close our vault to access. We don't want people to be touching the originals as much as possible anymore. So we felt that scanning the actual item as it looks, we don't do any manipulation to the image itself. We scan it as beautifully, we try to present it as beautifully as possible, and that we give the image that way. So that's why when you're scrolling down, you're going to see that, and this is another limitation of the software, that it sizes to the, the size of the first image. So going down, it stretched everything up, the two-page spread to make it fit into the same size as the first page. So that's why it looks weird, but um, you can go down and read the document right here. And there's, there's again, there's navigation, and I'm sure all of you are familiar enough with the internet to know what all those little pictures and icons and everything mean. Below, we put um, things we thought the librarians would like to see. <laughs> so these are the fields that came across from the MARC record. We have, we're not putting in every field in the MARC record. We didn't bring them all across for this initial data. And that's something we all have conversation about. Do we want the entire MARC record for everything that we bring into ADL? Is that necessary for the broader audience that we're trying to reach here? Those are the kinds of things that we'll have to discuss in the future. Right now, we brought we just brought in for the demo the things that we felt were the most important about the piece. Um, people and organizations. This is a module that is this um, platform is Drupal, and this is something that comes with part of the Drupal platform. and And I'll show you that in a minute. So I'll skip down. Library. This is the Library of Congress subject heading from our catalog that came across. So if I click on any of those, it will bring me all the search results within ADL that have those same, same thing as the library catalog. And we have theories as well. And then we tried to, I, we want to have the mark record in the display in some way. So we tried to kind of, this is a little bit of a, this is very rape, really. <laughs> there. But um, in this Talking, when we talk with the librarians deciding what we want to do, it may be that we want to show the full mark record or just something like this to show the code, or maybe it's not even necessary. We're just playing around showing what's possible here. Okay, so I'm going to go to the subject heading, and I've said, well, okay, that's interesting. I want to learn more about Magic College. So here's what will happen when you click on one of those. It will come up with everything you can see there's this is another problem. There's going to be a lot of bugs, but you can see there's a lot more stuff suddenly <laughs> than came up in that first search. So that, that's another part of the bugs that we're trying to work through. Um, but going down, so there's seven pages of items that have Madison College as a Library of Congress subject heading. And so I'm going to go look at this photograph of. You can see over on the right side that also goes through and finds things that are similar to what you're looking at. To help you. If you're just browsing around, it's very, very um, helpful there. So I ha have this picture. Again, you can download the original if you decide to, you want to use it. You can zoom in. And then down here again, we have the same information. And I'm going to click on, in this module, I'm going to show you a function of Drupal. So we have a, a area called people. And, and we have people and places and topics. We can do any type of a thing like this that is a way to bring um, a topic or a person or whatever, bring more information about them instead of someone obviously 
just intuitively knowing who Betsy DeGraff Sutherland was, there's a click on her name. If we just click on the top, the subject heading, you're just going to get more about her, but you have this way you can actually go in and read who she was immediately and find out, oh, I didn't know anything about her, now we know. And all of this I just took from obituaries right now. But we have name information, we can put any data in here about any of these people. And then we have this um, family section where we will link people together. So I can say, oh, oh look, she was married to Edward Alexander Sutherland. And they got married in 1954. If you click on the associated media, then you pull down everything in the database that has her name associated with it based on this people tag. And um, we also have an external links, which I'll show you more when we go, I'm going to go over to Edward Alexander because I developed him a little more. So we have a bio here, some information. We're able to link, like in here, I link to per Percy McGann's profile. I link to him. That way we can make it much more, oh, who's Percy? Going over there and finding out more. So we're able to do any type of text markup on in this area as well. Then we can, add, like I said, we can add much more information about people. I put in um, his physicians, why he might be important in Adventism, just knowing who he was. Go into family, you can see you can do parents, we have spouses, we have children. If they were important, depending on the level of importance we, we assign to a person or how much data there is about them. The associated, whoops, the associated media, media again, comes down. And external links, this is something that I thought was, we didn't have this before and I, I towards <coughs> getting close to this meeting I thought, hey, it would be cool if we also bring in things from outside. ADL and bring them in as well. So, and this is just some uh, world chat items. So if you click here, you can go in and you can see everything at world chat that he wrote or has his subject, his name as a subject heading. Quickly a way to maybe take someone to a, a, a library catalog or a, a, um, a search of some kind. I, you know, click to his memorial at find a grave. I mean, there's, this is just an example of what we could do. So you can see where he's buried, if you're interested. And then I call this the union, there's a lot of talk about the union catalog, that type of thing. Um, I just did the, what, uh, the Encore search in Andrews, because we don't have a union catalog yet. But an example of if we did have something like that of all the Adventist institutions, just the resources that aren't digital, a link to go into those and for someone who wants to find out more they can go and say oh I did the search for them they don't have to go and find out where where is the union catalog again where do I go find this stuff it's all the searches are already done for them so in the media so I'm going to go to this attendees of the first self-supporting convention was a photo postcard and you can see with in our photograph metadata we try as much as possible to identify the people in the photographs we spend actually much more time than we have in the past on photographs we sit and we try we do our best to figure it out so in this case and we have the little place markers and someone says hey that's my grandma in that picture, we're able to put her name in the little unknown where it belongs. And it makes it easier <coughs> to see. So we have a lot of unknowns in there, as you can tell. Mm -hmm. And then if we go to people and organizations, so you have the people that are listed up here that, we, that I've created these people profiles for. So you can go in and find out more about them here. But then there's also an organization one. This is the first meeting of the um, self-supporting institutions, which was the foundation of the Adventist, Adventist Layman group. So I actually went in and created a page for them. So you go in, you can find out what they are, their current website, their address, and where they are on the map. Mm -hmm. So it's a way, again, to 
goal is to bring all this information together in a way that people can quickly find out more and find the things that they um, need to know. For instance, um, the Review and Herald or the Pacific Press, all the locations, Battle Creek College, all these places that no longer exist. What I've done is tried to find the actual, and Stan Hickerson, who works in our office, has been invaluable to me. Gone in and actually tried to find the GPS coordinates of actually where it was. And I've actually done this, and maybe I can pull it up. I've done it for Battle Creek College. He told me, he showed me on the Google map exactly where it was located. So I put those coordinates in. And so now someone who actually wants to go see where the building stood, that sort of thing, they can actually go in and they can get the coordinates and they can go visit it if they want to. Or look at the Google you know, satellite view and see it. So um, this is just a little bit of the interaction and, and how the data part of ADL will work. I've also, um, we created for the Madison College alumni and us actually for this page as well, we created a timeline view, kind of uh, more along, more along the, there we go. So this is using an outside um, company that Stefan suggested. You go through and we put in a timeline of, of what it, Madison's beginning. If you go in, you want to go, oh, I want to see the Charter of Incorporation. There's a photo of it. You can go down, see some more information. Oh, wait, I actually want to read that, find out more. And you go in and it links to the item within Adventist Digital Library. So you then you can actually go in. There, there's the actual physical item. Go in and you can read it. I'll go back to the timeline. This, this timeline actually has a 3D view as well. So you can just kind of walk along the path. Go along. Oh, oh, oh yeah, I've seen that picture before, right? And you find out more, it will link to the actual picture at the White Escape website that identifies the people in the picture. So you get the idea of that. So this, this is something that is going to, I think, is going to be very popular and we can do any type of topic. And it's just going to be, who's going to want to write it and do the research? Because <laughs> this took me a long time. <laughs> this time. Right. For special collections. Yeah, special collections is great, yeah. <laughs> and then I did, we did put in a few records from the periodical index just to show how it could present within ADL if it decided to and this is just a view. Stefan put this together really quickly. I just manually entered these. I just picked a few. Obviously, all having to do with medicine. But uh, you go in, you say, okay, I want to see the dedication of the hospital. It has the subjects from the, the SCAPI. It has the series of the periodical index. That way, you can click on see all. But then if you click on the periodical itself, it will take you to the periodical within ADL so that you can actually read the article there. And we're trying to figure out different ways how we can make that because right now most of the, or a larger portion of the items within SCAPI don't have the link to the full text. So that's something that we would have to figure out how to make that hopefully very automatic. And then the last tab that we have is um, just resources, links to the research centers, links to libraries, that type of a thing. We would want to still um, advertise all of our uh, all of our institutions, have give people the option to go and view the other things that are on the site as well. So that's a brief overview. Yes. Can I just make a comment? This is because I don't live in this part of the world. Um, but for people who in other parts of the world, just having up something like uh, as in California, well, that means nothing to us. Um, you really need to, well, if it's possible, when, you, when you're inputting data, can you put more than just the location, but actually what country it's in as well? Okay. So, so, uh, you mean for 
in college? Yeah. Or any, any references that go in when... Can, can I just make a point that we have microphones here, all of us, and so all you have to do is press the button and everyone can hear. So uh, that's one reason we've scheduled it for this room. So uh, just press the button, and then when you finish talking, press the button again, and, uh, and it, will, it will turn off. Sorry, Rosalie, but it's very hard to hear you over here. Basically, right now, the data is dependent on how well the cataloger did. So let me make that statement. If we're bringing things over from the MARC record, usually we're not going to have someone looking at each import to make sure that the cataloger did a thorough job. So that, that's part of the answer. If when the record was cataloged, they put in the location of where the item came from or the school was, anything like that, it's true, you're right, because I know that for Andrews University, when we catalog, it, has no, it doesn't say where Andrews University is. It just says Andrews University. And that's, I can see where that would be a problem. There are many Andrews Universities probably across the world, or not many, but few. I know there is more you want. <laughs> so I, I, I understand what you're saying, and that's another um, portion of what we want to do to try to make this automatic, try to, part of it, part of the goal is to when we bring in something that has a certain subject heading or a certain type of a topic, we have coded the database to recognize key terms and to add also more metadata when it comes in. So say we know that the Andrews University is an issue in terms of a location, that's going to be an issue. So maybe when we tell the database if it sees Andrews University as a subject heading to add Bering Springs, Michigan, United States of America as another subject heading. So we do know that it is, it's very limited by how well the cataloger did. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One is, uh, will there be a way um, in which libraries, our libraries could uh, down the line pull digital assets or and or the corresponding metadata for use in our own applications or maybe our vendors applications, say our discovery system provider? The, we are making um, the ADL um, OAI compliant, I believe is the term, right? OAI. OAI compliant. So we are we are making it OAI compliant. So if you want to bring in these materials into your library search or anything, it will be possible. Thank you. And the other question is, uh, will there be a back end for our libraries to upload assets and metadata? And is there one that you could showcase? We don't have that right now. Right now, I know how we, we've been doing it for this test. It's basically me sending the files to Stefan at the White Estate. That's all it is right now. But there, there, that is definitely going to have to be figured out how we're going to do that. Either we'll have the institution themselves do it, or there'll be a you can submit your submit your submission to the person who does it all themselves. We're not sure right now. Can this be uh, made compatible with citation generators that are on the web, for example? Zotero is the one that CUC uses. And uh, I go on the archi archive site and then I need to copy the information into Zotero before it will generate the citation. Whereas in other websites, if you have Zotero and there are other citation generators, you can simply click and it does it. I don't know the answer to that. I do know we cr we can create a citation like I have we have at the top mm -hmm. already. We can create it if we all agree on a standardized citation. We can create create that, but I don't know. Yeah, the because to that. depending on the discipline that students are using, mm -hmm. it'll be Julie. right. Julie, I'll just answer on there. Okay. Um, as long as Zotero has an API, absolutely. In other words, an application interface, program interface, then 
um, ADL could be able to talk to it and do it. So it all depends on if they do or do not. Okay. I was just going to add to the Zotero that it should work even if ADL has nothing because of the browser. And I forget the term right now, but the plugins of the browser, if you have your Zotero button on your Google Chrome or whatever, because with the MARC data in there, Zotero should be able to read the web page. So, and I can talk to Julia or okay. whoever later about that. Uh, I think don't think we're really going to be wanting to recatalog everything. Is there some way to uh, click on California and lead you to Wikipedia or something that would then tell you where it is? Rather than if we were to try to try to put information on the location of every single term that goes in, that's a lot of recataloging. No, we're not, we're not suggesting that. I think no, that no. I mean the, yeah. the question was how would we put in uh, going back and, and making sure that every single term was identified as California, USA, or or I forget the name of the of the town in, that uh, in Australia where the, where the E.G. Whitehall was, but I, I think we would, we can, there are resources like Wikipedia that already have that information rather than right. trying to reinvent it. Right. Yeah, we can link to, again, we in many, there's going to be many things that we can add to do that type of thing. Yes, um, has consideration been given to using Dublin Core or um, the RDF, which is the new um, cataloging format that we're all adopting? Mm -hmm. um, that is what the Digital Public Library of America is based on, is Dublin Core and RDF. Um, we can't, basically the, the filters that we use to read the MARC record, we're, I'm using the MOZ collection right now because it much it had much more information that came across than if I used the Dublin Core one. But it's yeah, it's um, we can use either one. And we can make it display in any way we want to. That's the other thing. If we want to use the terminology that Dublin Core uses, because it's standard across the library type of world, then we can. That's you know, I thought it was odd when, you know, Loma Linda was asked to you know, submit some records at the last minute. Um, you know, our IT you know, individual, Gerald, was told that he had to take, we have all our digital um, records, um, the metadata is in Dublin Core. So he was told he has to translate that all into a MARC record and then it gets to you and you're translating it to XML and then right. going, why are we, you know, yeah. circling around so it basically, for every, how it's going to be, every library, I think every library is going to have its own import script because everyone does everything differently. I mean, MARC was a big discussion point, and so we tried to make it that MARC was the, everyone should have MARC records. And then we're realizing that, no, that's not how it is. Not mm -hmm. everyone uses MARC. So, well, yeah, MARC, if he had. MARC has been a standard for library cataloging, mm -hmm. yeah. print materials and right. things. But the industry standard for digital has been Dublin Core or, you know, the right. MOS, you know, which is Library of Congress and, you know, others. And so, and plus, MARC itself is changing, as Carlene said, right. you know, the RDA, and it's actually moving closer, slowly, to a more Dublin Core um, mm -hmm. right. format. So, I was a little concerned that uh, we're stepping well, this back. No, no, no. For, for this, it was a beta. We wanted to have some things from Melinda. So yeah. the way it happened with those dozen records or whatever isn't the way it's going to be. We have to work out with each institution their issues and. Yeah, I and, it's, and it's also the c it's also the case that at the meeting last May there was a a very pronounced request bordering on a demand to say these had to be able to be working Mark 21 records so we were doing what was requested. Yeah, except at that meeting I kept saying Dublin Core. <laughs> yes, but not everyone agrees with you, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I'm not sure I have my mic working right. Yeah. We can hear you. Oh, sorry. 
I think this is all beginning stage, to be quite honest. This will evolve. I'm quite impressed with what I've seen evolve in so far uh, with this demonstration. But I think as far as the importing, whether it be Mark, Devlin Core, or mods, still remains to be defined and it might be all of the above. But with this is a lot, huge step forward. I appreciate the work that's gone into it. Thank you. Um, I have um, maybe two questions. One, in terms of this uh, material that is in other languages, I mean, original would always be whatever it was, but in case there's a similar item that is in another language, is there going to be a way that the two will be linked or something? One. Two, for technology-wise, some of the some parts of the countries, or even here in the US, some areas might not have that high, powerful, uh, what do you call it? Bandwidth. Bandwidth. Bandwidth? Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. How are they going to download this thing? Because I looked at the first record, it took us about two minutes to get it mm -hmm. up and running. And I'm sitting in some village in, uh, well, somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just give up. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, from what I understand, I, I, and Daryl could probably explain this better if you want to, I understand a little bit from Stefan, is that the images themselves, they, um, when we send a PDF in, the, uh, the import of the PDF, how it converts to, sh to display here, actually converts it into three different file types. So depending on the type of browser, the type of your internet connection, it will choose automatically which one will come up faster for you. So, or better. In this case, it probably thought that this was a, am I correct? Yeah, essentially what it's doing a full in HTML4. So as long as you have an internet browser, i.e. 6, even, it will pull up in HTML4. What you're seeing there is Flash. Right. SWF <coughs> automatic converts it into that. It splits the PDF into an individual page. The individual page only loads one page at a time. That's why you can get the document loading quite quick. So your search terms are loaded to the individual page. You've got the whole PDF document. You can click on that download button, as you said. You can download the whole document. If um, a later browser is available, like HTML5, or say you're using your mobile, you're using an iPad like we have here, or a mobile phone, it'll pull it up in HTML5 for you. Um, and it also, um, so you've got those three formats, HTML4, HTML5, and also Flash. Now, Flash is normally only available on a computer and not on a mobile device, so it'll switch to HTML5 if you have a later device or an old device, the HTML4 is a little bit blurry, it's a little bit harder to read, but it's still viewable. And then it has the text behind the image that you can scan and search. So that's the three formats that automatically get converted when it gets imported. And another thing we're, that we're doing in our digitization department is we're converting everything that we do going forward into bitmap format as well. So I'm actually sending two PDFs into the ADL submission, a bitmap version that will display initially a bitmap version that will show up initially, which will make the loading much faster. So bitmap is just basically black, very black and white. There's no gray. So it's a very, very small file size. So those will come up first, and then if you want to see it in color or see it beautiful, then you can click on the download button to look at it. So we're thinking of, we're thinking of people in other countries, because really these are the people that we really need to reach, the people that can't come to our libraries. They can't even come to the U.S. to see anything. So we are thinking of that. We have a, another question. Oh, do you want to do questions? <laughs> yeah, maybe um, after my presentation on digitization, we have a big question answer session. Maybe um, we can continue this then. Okay, thank you. A little bit more on the time frame. Um, we have, at this point, pulled in data from four institutions. Granted, Loma Linda is only token. Twelve records is very token. The truth is, ours is fairly token at the Center for Adventist Research, too. We have, what, 300 records or so? We have scanned thousands and thousands, 21,000 records that will come into this. At this point, they're not there. Um, we have taken token material from from uh, GC archives as well. What the Review and Herald and is about 8,000 records, right? 
Just under eight. And you have how many just to roughly? So about 10% of the GC archives is in. Basically, we were bringing these in to see how it work. And then why the state is already, because it's kind of native to what's been done on the software. I mean, they, they knew how to do that. So at this point, we want to make sure everything's working right as far as transfers of the data and the, the way the program works with that data. And that's what will be happening over this next year. We're not really, we are not planning to have the, the digital library go live until next June. So at that point, we may not have all of this in, we may, and we'll be working first with Loma Linda. Now as far as the other institutions, we want to make sure we have these initial ones that have the most Adventist historical data available working so we can start to get that material in. And once we've got that clear, then as we have time, we're able to manage it. We want to start working with other institutions as well. But initially, we're not going to try to just say, okay, all of you. <laughs> it's just not going to work that way. So initially, we want to get our data in. We want to get the rest of the data from GC Archives. We want to begin to continue working with Loma Linda. That may have to wait even until after June, depending on how fast we can do the other part. And what the nice thing about this is you can keep building it. And as long as the platform works and you can keep building it, that's what we can do. So the interim plan here between now and next June is to continue to work this to a place where we can present it um, by next June as something that people can start to use. Uh, there is an interim plan as well that I just want to briefly introduce. I waited till now just to, to say it. Um, when I talked about the funding model um, a little while ago with the four major trajectories that funds are coming from, one of them being ASDAL, Andrews University, GC appropriation, NAD appropriation, and then research libraries as we're able to make that work. That is beginning in June of 2015. Uh, we have requested from the General Conference a uh, special appropriation of $150,000. This was also discussed with, with Bob Lemon to help with the implementation of ADL to get the staffing in place, to get the rest of the work on data and other things that need to be done to get us till next June and the official launch. So the regular budget would not begin until, until next year when that process actually begins as a part of the income model that we discussed and expense model. So this first year from now until next June is the, um, the development phase to get the product to where it can actually be made available to people and put out. So that's just a little bit more information to help you as well. Well, I see it's 12. We're not done today, we could, but we do have lunch, and I think probably there are some rumbling stomachs or something, so we'll take care of that issue before we continue. I want to say thank you to Julie, too, for her work. She's been a real godsend at the Center for Adventist Research, and I hope and I pray for ADL. <laughs> 